we like to think that the effects of the meditation we do will automatically have an impact on our daily lives. It does have some impact automatically. You come out of meditation. It's like taking something out of a refrigerator. It's going to be cool for a while, depending on how much heat you expose it to. If you take it out of the refrigerator on a hot day when it's 110 outside, it's not going to stay cool very long. But if you take it out of the refrigerator and you put in a cooler on a cool day, it'll stay cool longer. The cooler stands for your determination that you are going to carry the meditation into your daily life. In other words, it's not automatic that the meditation will have an impact. You have to decide this is what you want to do. You want to take whatever skills you can manage, whatever sense of peace and well-being you can manage during the meditation, and see how long you can maintain it as you go into the day. Now, Sometimes you may find that the temperature outside is pretty hot. In other words, you find yourself in difficult situations where you find it hard to maintain your sense of the breath at the same time dealing with all the activity around you. But sometimes, and all too often, you're the one who destroys the, the sense of being centered, the sense of having a nice sense of good breath energy in the body. This is where you begin to see the power of your own defilements. A lot of people resist the idea that their minds have defilements, but that's usually because they don't know the difference between a defiled and an undefiled state. So it all looks the same. And John Fuang's image was of a floor that you never clean. The dust settles, and more dust settles, and more dust settles, and you, you don't really see the dust, how much dust has settled today, because it just adds to what's already there. But he says if you wipe the floor down every day, you notice every little speck of dust that comes in. So as you're trying to maintain a sense of center, be alert to the fact that what you're going to see is your defilements trying to destroy your your concentration. They come in three large categories. There's greed, aversion, and delusion, and they work themselves out into all kinds of other things. There's spite and malice and hypocrisy and envy. I can't remember the whole list, about fifteen altogether, what they call the upigilesa. But you notice these things best if you've had the mind in concentration and you try to maintain that sense of center. And you begin to hear more clearly the voices in your own mind, all the different committee members. And this is where it's good to have some practice with the, the phrases for goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Because if you f suddenly find yourself talking to yourself about somebody else in an envious way or a spiteful way, You notice that it doesn't really go together with, uh, may all beings be happy. May all beings not be deprived of the good fortune they have attained. That doesn't go with envy. Malice doesn't go with goodwill. And so if you can get the mind quiet and see if you can carry at least some sense of stillness into the day. You'll be in a better position to see how these defilements come and go, and you recognize them as defilements. And also begin to recognize them as something you don't want to get involved with. The problem is all too often that we like our defilements. They're our old friends, our habitual ways of doing things. We have a certain familiarity with them. And part of the mind is of the opinion that this is just the way the mind has to be. You're not going to change anything. And when you start changing it, it feels out of whack, that something's wrong and unfamiliar. It's like somebody who's been leading to the left for 
for years and years, and suddenly you straighten them out. It feels weird to be straight. Now, they'll feel more inclined to lean back to the left again, which is what they're familiar with. So this is something you have to watch out for, is your sense of familiarity. And also the sense that the mind will often say, well, this is just the way things have to be. How can a mind function without some greed, aversion, and delusion? I may not put it quite in those terms, but certain ways of talking to yourself just seem to be a normal part of how you survive in life. Sometimes we think of it as our armor as we go through the day. Well, remember what armor is like. It's big and clunky, and it weighs you down. I mean, the armor you get with the breath. If you're with the breath and the breath energy is good, it creates a kind of force field around you. Where the things that you used to have to fight off with your spite or malice or whatever, you find that you can deflect it without any of those unskillful mind states. You have to develop some confidence in the breath. So you see that you don't really don't need these defilements. When you see that you don't need them, you can begin looking, looking more carefully into, well, why do you like them? They provide a certain amount of pleasure. But if you can have the pleasure of meditation, it carries some of that pleasure in a daily life. You find that you're not quite so hungry for them. And when you find the mind going for them, you realize it's just out of habit. Again, it's not automatic that doing the concentration and having a sense of well-being will starve these defilements or keep you from going back to them. It's so easy to drop the concentration go back to your old ways because they're habitual. But if you're determined, you don't want to be led by the nose by these things. That's when you have a chance of resisting their power. In John Munn's final sermon, one of the most memorable lines is the one where he talks about going into battle with the defilements. It's the determination, he says, not to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. You know, they lead you by the nose and get you to do all kinds of stupid things, and then when the karma from those stupid things comes, they don't suffer. It's like people who convince you that you should go down and break a store window or something. And then, of course, when you do that, they run away and the police catch you. So John Munn said, it's, this is what you have to maintain above all else, is your determination not to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. That's an attitude you want to nourish, because it helps you to resist the power of what's familiar, the power of what the mind says, well, it just has to be this way, and I'm not going to hear anything else. It's like political parties. They get into collusion and say, we're going to offer only these alternatives to the public, and we're not going to allow anybody to think anything outside of the box. Well, that's how your defilements treat your mind. They don't want you to think outside the box. They have their ideas of what will make you happy. And even though their ideas are diluted, they really hold to them very tightly. And of course, because these defilements have been your identities in the past, it's very easy to slip back into them. This is where the image of the Committee of the Mind comes together with the image of the Buddhist teachings on bhava or becoming. You take on a becoming, and it's something. It's like a set of clothing you've worn in the past, and it's very easy to put it back on again. At some time in the past you found that spite and malice and envy and insolence and all the other children of defilement got you some pleasure, gave you some pleasure. And when you're in a hungry mood, or you don't know anything else to do, you don't have anything better to do, you just go back and slip on those old that old set of clothes take on that identity again, and it's you again. And then once it's you, it's a very hard time. You have a very hard time of seeing it as a defilement, realizing it's something you want to let go. This is why the Buddha said that to gain discernment, we have to see all these things as separate, 
whatever comes up in the mind, good, bad, or indifferent, you have to see it as something separate from your awareness. So you can actually look at it. Where is it going? Where does it come from? Is it taking you someplace you really want to go? Is it a voice you want to identify with? So the concentration is a tool for helping in daily life, but you have to be determined, one, to bring the concentration in, and then two, to use it for the right purpose, which is to figure out how the mind deceives itself all the time into thinking that very unskillful attitudes will actually lead to happiness. Again, it's the determination that makes the difference, as John Munn said. You may not put it quite in the way that he did, but there's got to be a certain amount of determination to carry these things through. Otherwise, you take the mind out of the refrigerator of concentration and it's cool for a few minutes. And then you're back to where you were before and you get disappointed. You say, what's wrong with the concentration? Why isn't it changing my life? You have to use the concentration with the right motivation. That's when it will make important changes.